We are today at uh, PCR TV uh, from uh, Paris, uh, PCR 2017, and it's uh, a friendly honor to be with our two distinguished uh, faculty. Uh, Daniel Burkhoff uh, from New York, uh, working at Cardiovascular Research Foundation and affiliated to Columbia University. And Volkermann Falk from Germany, he's a cardiac surgeon working at uh, the German Heart Center and also at uh, Charité Hospital in, in Berlin. So um, the topic today is uh, trying to share with the audience uh, uh, interventions in the field of uh, acute heart failure. So I would like to start with you, uh, Daniel. Can you maybe give us some insight about what are finally the devices uh, interventional cardiologists uh, should uh, know about in the field of uh, acute heart failure? Nowadays, uh, you know, patients with cardiogenic shock and acute heart failure are presenting more frequently and are presenting a real challenge to, uh, to the uh, cardiologist because of the high mortality that it's associated with. So there are several approaches that, that are available now. And the cardiologist and the, and the team needs to decide which device is the appropriate one for each, each particular patient. So at the one extreme, we have medications. And we know that these medications, uh, inotropes, pressors, these uh, uh, do things to the heart itself that are really not beneficial. They increase the oxygen demand, they increase the work on the heart, and these can lead to worsening of heart failure. So this is really why there's such an emphasis on development of devices. So if we go from the, the let's say historically, we've had the balloon pump, intra-aortic balloon pump counterpulsation for 50, 60 years. And so this is one device which there's been some clinical trials about which have not been so favorable, but still it is, it is in use in some institutions, but in some institutions its, it's use is really waning. Uh, so from there we then have devices that are active mechanical pumps that take blood from one part of the circulation and deliver it to the other. For example, we have a device that goes from the left atrium, takes blood via a transeptal puncture, takes the blood from the left atrium, oxygenated blood, and delivers it to, back to the arterial system. So that's one class of devices. We have other devices that are transvalvular, transaortic valvular, and these devices take blood from the left ventricle and pump it into the aorta. That's another class. And then we have the, the class of devices that are uh, under, the, under the broad heading of ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, where take blood from the venous system, generally the right atrium or the femoral or the inferior vena cave, ephemeral vein, uh, pass it through an oxygenator and deliver it back to the arterial system. There are many different configurations for ECMO, so it gets into a, a much more complicated discussion. In, but in general, the VA configuration, drawing from the venous system and delivering back to the arterial system is the, is the general method that, that cardiologists will be, uh, will be familiar with, should be familiar with. And there are some newer devices, transvalvular pumps that are pulsatile as opposed to continuous flow that are in development that we've heard about. So maybe for, for our interventional cardiologists uh, who might use these devices in their regular clinical practice, uh, what are finally the advantages and, and disadvantages of these devices which are finally pretty available in, in the field? All these devices have different ways of action, if you wish, and uh, it is important to understand that they have a different role in the continuum of medical care. Um, it is certainly one indication to do a high-risk PCI or other intervention, especially in the uh, um, cardiac shock si uh, situation, uh, where a support system, mechanical support system, will allow the cardiologist to do, safely do the procedure without the time constraints and without the hemodynamic compromise that the patient comes with into the hospital. The trials that have been done in this setting were also not so successful in terms of heart outcomes, mortality, but we were told that uh, at least there is some hints in the literature and in the more recent trials that there may be an additional benefit of this therapy. Two current trials are addressing the question, should you start with the intervention and then put in a device if the patient deteriorates, or should you first put in a device and then do the intervention while the heart is already unloaded? This is an open question and remains to be seen. Then the fundamental differences are that these transaortic devices are decompressing the heart, they're unloading the ventricle. And the overloaded ventricle with the high end diastolic pressure, of course, decreases coronary circulation, decreases perfusion of the heart, and the reverse remodeling that we hope for, be it in the acute setting or even in the chronic setting, can only take place if the heart is decompressed. 
and this will also decrease the oxygen demand of, of the heart. Um, and therefore, systems that unload the ventricle may have a potential benefit over those that can't. On the other hand, ECMO is a system that creates five liters of output, can be installed virtually everywhere in every hospital and also every setting, even outside the cardiology suite. Patients can be transported and it also features the possibility of oxygenation. So for some patients who are in cardiogenic shock, acute heart failure and who have need ventilation and also uh, oxygenation, the added benefit of having an oxygenator uh, is of course uh, great. On top of this, we may see a number of patients where we actually need both systems. We need an ECMO because we simply need five liters of flow and in addition, a system that can decompress the heart on top. And then the sequence of how those systems are put in, the, if you wish, escalation of therapy, that is also something that we need to explore better and that the future will tell us who are the patients that qualify for what type of therapy. To the end of the spectrum, what we want to avoid is futility, putting in these devices in patients that are dead. Uh, and so we have to better understand the indications, the way of action, the mode of action, and when and how we should treat those patients. So uh, what I understand from uh, both of your comments is that one size does not fit all. So maybe can you give us some ideas about how the future could look in the field and what type of new devices or new approaches could be shared? Uh... Sure. I think um, that first and foremost um, is for cardiologists in particular to start under having a better appreciation for the physiology and the fact that these devices do different things. So this is something that has been missing in the education and, um, and is really necessary to say, okay, all pumps will create three, four, five liters of flow, but because they take blood from a different part of the circulation, they have a different effect on the heart, as was just really described very eloquently. That's a critical thing to understand that not every pump works the same. But, but if you look at the, at the library, if you will, of devices that are available, there's quite a nice library of devices. And um, on top of, of the commercially available devices, uh, surgeons and cardiologists are, are quite innovative in in jury rigging and, and connecting, uh, making new connections uh, using the, the, the equipment that's available. And there, again, you need, you need a very good understanding of the physiology to do this. So what I see um, for the, let's say for the near-term future, are, is, is incremental improvements in the deliverability, in the use of the, of the, of the device, the, 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 the features, the control panels, uh, the insertion methods, the, withdrawal, the, the methods for withdrawal and, and hemostasis. I see incremental improvements in each of these classes of devices. But on top of that, I think there's much more interest now from the cardiology community in doing studies on these devices and understanding and filling some of the gaps in knowledge. So I see that there's a large opportunity for, for additional work to, to clarify the, the, uh, where these devices are useful in which, in which setting. And we have clear hypotheses about when to use which device and when to combine devices. And unfortunately, this may not be in the form of prospective randomized trials with a hard endpoint of mortality because of the difficulty in doing these studies. But I do feel that the more we learn about the physiology, the more the physicians can be informed about when to pick which device. So that's where I see it, incremental improvements in the device and a lot of emphasis on the research, uh, the clinical research. Thank you. And what about you as a cardiac surgeon working with interventional cardiologists? Uh, how do you see the future? Well, I think uh, we, we're making a great progress in the treatment of heart failure. Um, we will be able to save a number of patients who are in acute cardiogenic shock and acute heart failure. The question is, once they bridged to an intervention or to a decision-making process, which then has to start, the question is, what is the next step? And of course, we want to stabilize the patient and check if he qualifies for left ventricular assist therapy for long-term support be it as bridge to transplantation or destination therapy. And then, on the other hand, see who is qualifying for transplantation. And right now we have short-term percutaneous devices and we have long-term surgical devices. Uh, but what the future will show is that these percutaneous devices will slowly progress in filling the gap for intermediate or even long-term support. In, in order to do that, of course, we need devices that are safe, 
hemolysis shouldn't be occur, should not occur. Uh, vascular complications should be almost zero, and uh, anticoagulation is an issue, of course. Uh, so there is a number of issues that need to be solved, but I see it as a continuum um, where the surgeon still has a role, and I'm very happy for our very close collaboration. Good. So I think uh, for our audience. Uh we had the opportunity to really share a couple of very important information for interventional cardiologists uh, who are uh, used uh, to deal with these uh, devices. Uh, uh, with a lot of clinical practice, there is still a gap between what we are doing in the clinical practice and trials or uh, research needed to improve uh, our knowledge and the way we want to practice on, our, on, on a daily basis. I think that uh, uh, two very important points have been shared by our faculty. First, the need to better understand physiology and try to really understand the mechanism of action of current devices and, and coming devices. Second, also this very important point about the, the daily practice. Uh, be able to maybe minimize uh, the size of the devices, uh, try to come up with more percussion maintenance approach and try also to think about the environment, uh, namely uh, how to deal with anticoagulant therapy, how to follow up this patient, how to organize the dialogue between surgeon and interventional cardiologist. So thank you very much for your uh, presence here at uh, PCR 2017 and I hope uh, the audience enjoyed this session about intervention in the field of acute heart failure. Thank you. Thank you.